Think of four women you know. Think of your mom, your grandmothers, maybe a couple of your teachers. Chances are, at least one of these women has been abused at some point in their life. According to data from the CDC, one in four women and one in seven men will experience physical violence by their intimate partner at some point during their lifetime. And if we consider that emotional abuse is much harder to detect, report, and prove, then the statistics jump even higher. If this is a problem that affects so many men and women, why aren't we taught more about how to prevent it? Hi everybody, my name is Sarah, and today I'd like to talk to you about how a relatively simple theory in psychology can be used to prevent and address abusive relationships. Brief disclaimer that today's talk will be largely oriented around the idea of men abusing women, as this is the angle most research has explored so far. However, women still abuse men, women still abuse women, and men still abuse men. Any person can abuse someone else. Another important disclaimer, I am not a counselor or a psychologist or a doctor. I'm a psychology student pursuing my degree, and I think this is important for you to know. In the midst of the Me Too movement, there's been a lot of backlash against the validity of victims' accusations. In cases like the Harvey Weinstein trial, his lawyer argued that the woman who accused Weinstein of raping her was involved in a consensual relationship with him for many years. He used emails between Weinstein and his accuser to illustrate that she willingly chose to continue to see him, even after the alleged rape happened. And you know, this was enough to make a lot of people doubt victims' stories. It conflicts with how people logically evaluate the situation. After all, if someone is abusing you, why would you continue to keep them in your life? You wouldn't do that, would you? Today, our, our focus is not going to be why outside observers devolve into victim blaming in situations like this, although it is certainly closely linked with our discussion. Instead, we're going to be looking at the root cause. Why do victims stay with their abusers even after the abuse has started? Now, to be fair, this is a highly complex topic and that answer varies by individual. We're going to be looking at only one aspect of this situation, but one that informs a lot of other victim behaviors. Beyond concrete, practical reasons that victims stay with abusers, there's also something internal that might be keeping victims paralyzed. These victims might have convinced themselves that the relationship is not abusive. Where does this self-delusion come from? And more importantly, what can be done to prevent it? Don't worry. Just by watching this video, you're making progress. First of all, let's tackle the psychology. In psychology, there is something called self-perception theory. It states that people infer their attitudes by observing their own behaviors. It originally came from psychologist Daryl J. Bem's research surrounding cognitive dis dissonance theory, which is the more rec widely recognized theory today. Unlike cognitive dissonance theory, which is focused on what is going on strictly inside someone's head, Bem differentiated self-perception theory as a combination of behaviors and attitudes, or as someone's response to current stimuli and responses. In Bem's 1972 paper in which he sketches out what self-perception theory means, he describes a study in which subjects were asked to tell a lie under one colored light and then a truth under another light. They then had to state attitudes which they disagreed with, with the different lights turning on for each statement. Later on, these participants were seen to endorse the attitudes they had said under the truth light more so than under the lie light. Bem concluded that, that the light, an external factor, determined what subjects believed about their own actions. And Bem's theory has seemed to survive the test of time. A study from 2019 this one looking at the connection between self-perception and life satisfaction, found that through the process of compensatory adjustment, self-perceptions are subconsciously brought into balance to relieve dissonance. Self-perception theory is all about the adjustments we make to try to reconcile our behaviors with how we think of ourselves. Make sense? Let's try another example. Maybe you rode your bike to work one day because you couldn't start your car and forgot that you could have caught the bus. The ride was tedious, but you reflected on your behavior and thought, yeah, well, I did that because I love the environment. You inferred your attitudes by observing your own behavior, even though it might not be an accurate connection. Now, how does this self-perception theory play into abusive relationships? Let's take a look. A 2019 study looked at the consequences abusive supervision practices had on the supervisor themselves. Although this is from the opposite perspective than you might have expected, 
This study showed that individuals' sense of how much others depend on them is affected by behavioral factors. Often, part of victims' reluctance to leave abusive relationships is the idea that their partner needs them, that they are helping their partner be a better person, that their partner could not survive without them. This perspective is frequently not lost on the abuser themselves, who sometimes exploit this mentality by pressuring the victim to stay. Let's look at this through an example. Let's say that Haley and Michael are dating. Michael always tells Haley that no one else will ever understand her like he does. Everybody else would be too freaked out by who she really is. When Michael is in a bad mood, he calls up Haley and verbally abuses her over the phone, belittling her to make himself feel better. At the end of the phone call though, he tells her, I love you. No one else can make me feel better like you do. I couldn't live without you. Out of context, this seemingly cheesy line isn't inherently harmful. However, Haley just withstood being verbally torn apart and is in a vulnerable state. Hearing those meager words of praise has an effect. Haley looks retroactively at her behavior of picking up the phone and continuing the conversation as an act of love and devotion on her part, rather than seeing it as part of a toxic cycle that Michael has trapped her in. A study from 2001 examined the connection between introspection and self-perception. It found that self-focus, rather than creating a more accurate knowledge of oneself, actually increases the motivation for consistency. We know that object perception is more accurate than self-perception, meaning evaluations focused outward are more likely to be correct than those focused inward. Beyond that, this study showed that focusing inward makes people more eager to align how you act with how you think of yourself. Moreover, self-directed attention initiates a comparison between the self and salient standards that specify states the self ought to have. All right, let's go back to Haley and Michael. Let's say Haley thinks of herself as someone with high standards, with a lot of self-worth, and determined to make something of herself. There are enough good moments with Michael that Haley convinces herself that what she has is a positive relationship. After all, she is doing everything she can to keep the relationship going. If she has such self-worth, and her behaviors all point towards preserving the relationship, this must be a healthy relationship, right? That's what Haley convinces herself of, at least. As Sylvia and Gondola 2001 found, the judgments of self-focused people are less influenced by external information. Therefore, when Haley should be paying closer attention to how Michael is treating her and how others perceive their relationship, external information, she is instead looking inward, where she is motivated to attain a consistency between her behaviors and her attitudes. It is a vicious cycle. A 2013 study looked at this drive for consistency specifically in the context of abusive relationships. It framed this motivation for consistency in the way most of us would do so, commitment. We think of ourselves as being in committed relationships. This is often a marker of how long-term or successful the relationship is. However, what is the cost of the value we place on commitment? The study found that since commitment and consistency are parts of cognitive dissonance, women often try to attain attitude behavior consistency, even when enduring abuse. Researchers found that many factors contribute to women staying in abusive relationships, however. Women who blame themselves for the abuse are more likely to stay, for one thing. Furthermore, the normalization of abuse from earlier relationships, combined with things like less education, having children, having less resources, and stronger identification with traditional gender roles, all predicted that women were more likely to stay with an abusive partner. Because the sense of commitment grows over time, women should try to leave sooner rather than later. The researchers' primary advice was that perhaps the best way to decrease the number of abusive relationships is by educating women before they find themselves trapped in one. Listen to your discomfort. Let's look at how this relates to Haley and Michael. Let's say that when they first started dating, Michael would occasionally do things that made Haley uncomfortable, such as putting his hand on her upper thigh while they were sitting at public events. She shook it off as being too sensitive. They celebrated their first month together, and Haley was thrilled that they were getting along so well. What used to make her uncomfortable, she now rationalizes, as it being because she's wearing revealing clothing. She rationalizes his rude and demeaning comments as because she provoked them. As time goes on, they stay together from month upon month, Haley acclimates to what she once thought would get better. Now, the worst behavior is just her average day. It will be significantly harder for her to leave the relationship now. 
This moves us to our final part of today's discussion, how an awareness of self-perception theory can help get you out of abusive relationships. A 2008 study looked at the self-perception of women who lived with an alcoholic partner. This study gave women the chance to express their situation in their own words. It took into account that self-perception reflects not only personal identity as the individual sees it, but also the social, historical, and political contexts in which that individual exists. The pressures and inequities that surround certain women due to having multiple stigmatized identities often affects their ability and willingness to leave abusive partners. The study found that the sense of guilt and difference seeped into the women's self-perception, largely because of their surrounding society that reminded them of their responsibility for their partner's behavior. Although many women focused on the normal aspects of their lives and their relationships, this thinking ultimately impedes you from leaving what is obviously an unhealthy situation. Another study, this one from 2015, drew attention to the many factors that affected women's decisions in the face of abusive relationships. Although Western cultures often focus on individual decisions, which is often what leads to victim blaming, but that's a topic for another time, there are societal, situational, and personal forces that exert enormous influence in these circumstances. The forces that this study highlighted were individual characteristics, interpersonal influences, community and organizational factors, and social, political, and cultural arenas in which the person existed. Women often feel trapped not only by their partner, but by the larger system. Let's say Haley never finished college. She's working a full-time job at minimum wage that makes it impossible for her to afford her own place, so she's living with Michael. She grew up in a conservative family. Haley wakes up early every morning to make Michael breakfast, and he expects her to have the house cleaned before he gets home from work at night. If he hits her occasionally, Haley is too tired to object. Haley can't imagine her life without Michael, even if she wanted to. He is a central part of not only her romantic life, but also her financial stability, her housing assurance, and the fulfillment of what she thinks her life should look like. There has been research in recent years about how to best teach strategies to adolescents to equip them to avoid abusive relationships. A 2011 study was conducted in Australia, applying a pilot program in a few schools. Its core tenets were choosing, noticing, responding, ending, and bouncing back. This program defined chronic partner abuse as any pattern of harm-causing interaction between partners. This included emotional, social, and physical harm. The program also told participants that warning sign behaviors were dominant seeking, possessiveness, denigration, conflict control tactics, and retaliatory responding. Noticing these behaviors is the first and most important step to safely accepting unhealthy relationships. Doing this rattles the self-perception theory at play. Behaviors are not just connected to fabricated attitudes, but can be connected to concrete examples of abuse that have been taught to them. Taking into account the research about commitment and increased tolerance of abusive behaviors, this program sought to increase participants' capacity to resist slippery slope dynamics. It focused on making girls more assertive early on, increasing awareness of risks, and increasing self-confidence. Most importantly, this study found, through implementation of the program, that increased self-confidence was associated with decreased victim blaming. This means that the girls learned not only to not blame themselves for abuse, but to extend this awareness to others they saw trapped in similar dynamics. Let's go back to Haley and Michael. Let's say that one day, Haley's best friend comes to visit her. The two of them go out to lunch. The best friend notices that Haley is withdrawn, jumpy, and anxious. They ask Haley about how things have been going lately, and Haley reluctantly tells them limited details about her life and current relationship. The best friend can tell something is wrong. During lunch, Michael calls Haley and demands to know where she is, who she is with, and how much money she is spending. The best friend carefully points out afterwards that Michael seems kind of controlling. They tell Haley she can always sleep at their apartment if she needs to, even if it's for an extended time. This challenges the self-perception Haley had carefully crafted and maintained over the past year, that everything was fine. Haley denies that anything is wrong, but the thought stays with her when she goes home that day. 
A 2017 study looked at the mental and active preparation women took when preparing to leave an abusive relationship. The researchers collapsed leaving an abusive relationship into three stages. First, the woman does not recognize or is denying the abuse. Second, the woman is coping with the abuse, considering her options, and choosing to leave. Third, the woman is remaining separated from her abuser. Leaving often takes multiple attempts, thus why remaining separated is an imperative stage to this recovery process. Mentally planning to leave could only start once they had emotionally disconnected from their abuser. The leaving itself is a complicated process and often does not develop in a linear fashion. For the sake of time, let's fast forward through the next year of Haley and Michael's relationship. Haley has continued to talk to her best friend, who has connected her with a free counseling texting service for domestic violence victims. Haley now realizes that Michael has been abusing her for the past few years. She tried going back to her parents' house, but Michael tracked her down and guilted her into returning to live with him. She's living with him again, but she now has a duffel bag hidden in the cleaning closet with some money she's been saving from her paychecks, as well as a couple sets of clothes and her passport. Michael was sweet the first couple weeks she was back, but he's returned to being verbally and physically aggressive towards her. She got a black eye last night. This morning, when she was going to work, she took the duffel bag with her, claiming that it was a gym bag. After work, she plans to go to her friend's apartment and stay there. It is no easy task to leave an abusive relationship, no matter how long you've been in it. This challenge is only further exasperated by the distortion that self-perception theory creates. It is incredibly difficult to be told that we can't trust our own behaviors, or at least that our behaviors might be making us believe things that simply aren't true. However, with the right preparation and tools, leaving early and with greater understanding of why can be achieved. The first and often hardest step, awareness. Recognizing that you are being abused is imperative and often incredibly painful. But hopefully, with the knowledge of self-perception theory from this video, you can start to think about your relationships. What is your partner doing? What are you doing? And why? Good luck, and be safe.